Um, now uh, we are going to go into our afternoon session, and uh, the focus is going to be on Ruach HaKodesh in the Tanakh, and so we're going to have David Nekrutman and Pastor Mario Bramnick uh, each speaking one after the other to uh, address us on the topic. Thank you. Good afternoon. Holy Spirit in the Tanakh is the uh, subject I'm going to be talking about, sort of to give the uh, foundation to what we wish to accomplish this year in bringing pastors and rabbis together to talk about, in theological terms, what this actually means and have these conversations to end up doing a mission to Israel, which I think is the first time where rabbis and pastors will actually go to Israel and visit the spots but where the Holy Spirit in Tanakh was very relevant in faith. So you call it a Holy Spirit tour. In order to truly understand Holy Spirit, you have to understand divine concealment. We can't appreciate what it means to go ahead and work with the Holy Spirit if you do not understand what we call in Hebrew, Hester Panim. After Moses passes the mantle of leadership to Joshua in the book of Deuteronomy, God informs the Israelites that they will worship other gods. This is not an if situation. It's a definite thing that's going to happen in the history of Israel, that he will be angry against them, as, and as a consequence of their sin of idolatry, God promises to remove his face from the people. And then after that, there will be many troubles in the history of Israel. In response, Israel finally acknowledges their abandonment of God and the cause of evils that they are experiencing from him. And they respond in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 18, but I will surely have concealed my face on that day. So they acknowledged that God has been gone, and then the reaction of the abandonment of it is that God will now surely hide his face. Now if you look at the book of Deuteronomy, he's saying that if you do the sin, I'm going to remove myself. They acknowledge what's going on, and then God goes ahead and goes into hiding again. Now in Hebrew, there is a double expression of hiddenness. It's haster, hastir. In, in the English translations, it's usually surely, or a variant of that word surely. But in Hebrew, it's actually more intense. Double, God goes into sort of a hiding in his hiding. So I'm trying to understand, looking at the text right now, Israel acknowledges the problem, but in response, God goes into more hiding. Like, what is this? What's going on here? So let's understand the, the word hester panim, divine concealment. It appears 26 times in the Bible in the Old Testament, with the majority of references in the book of Psalms. And it appears a few times in the prophetic works in Isaiah, Ezekiel, and in Micah, Jeremiah, and Job. Unlike the five books of Moses that links the divine concealment to sin of idolatry, the prophetic works actually expands the sin genre. In the book of Isaiah, the sin genre for God's concealment includes murder, violence, deceit, corruption, of justice. This is all in chapter 59 of the book of Isaiah. In Micah chapter 3, scripture goes even further by looking at the cruelty of Israel's leaders towards her citizens and neighbors, the prophets selling their prophecies to the people. So I can read your palm, pay me, and I'll let you know about your fortune. And also the total embrace of evil altogether causes God to remove himself from his people. Yet in the book of Job, God removes himself from Job even though he's a righteous person. So it just seems like whether we are in good relationship with God or a very bad relationship with God, 
God somehow is going to remove himself from the equation. Well, this is sort of a very scary notion. Here I am. God removes himself. How am I ever supposed to get to him? This is the worst nightmare for any person of faith. So I want to give a, a thesis statement that if you look at the Bible, the Bible's whole direction is a concept of divine concealment and that God wants us to operate in that hiddenness to come to him. Very much what we were talking about this morning about working in silence, praying in that silent mode that we feel that aloneness and we shouldn't feel that way because God is with us. The same way is that you have sort of have to look at the Holy Spirit that it only operates within hiddenness. And this is the direction, at least for us in Tanakh. Since the Sinaitic Revelation, which is probably the unprecedented theophany of God entering into the world, there's a downward spiral. In the book of Samuel, first book of Samuel, chapter 3, verse 21, when scripture talks about when the nation of Israel knew that he was a prophet, God's last, that he knew he was the last prophet. But God's last appearance to a human being is with King Solomon. This is in 1 Kings, chapter 3, verse 5. And I want to understand what it means, the last appearance to a human being. If you'll see, usually God says something to Moses saying such. God speaks to David or speaks to Solomon. And the, when you look at the 38 kings afterwards, it's always God appearing to somebody. So this revelation that happens in sort of a direct communication, the biggest one being with Moses, obviously, and the lesser with uh, David and Solomon and Samuel, or all of a sudden goes into after the kingdom is split up, God goes into a little bit more hiding, a little bit more withdrawal. The last public miracle in Tanakh is at Mount Carmel, 1 Kings chapter 18. This is the showdown. This is the great western we see in movies. Hey, we have the gods of Baal, right? And we have the God of Israel. Elijah is setting up the stage. God, basically, Elijah is asking God for a miracle. A fire is supposed to come from heaven. Indeed, God listens to Elijah, brings down the fire needed, and it seems to be a great moment. This is going to be the last public miracle because in the next chapter, Elijah has some psychological problems. <laughs> He's a little nervous about Jezebel. And it's literally like, the, I guess, the dream for Freud. There is this prophet venting out to God of all the woes and problems he's facing. It just really doesn't make any sense. You just had a miracle in the chapter beforehand, and you're going to through this severe depression. And through this dialogue, God speaks to Elijah in the following words. He's bringing fire. He's bringing smoke. He's bringing an earthquake. And he says, I am no longer in this. If you remember, earthquake, fire, smoke, these were the natural stuff that was happening at the greatest theophany at Sinai. And God is saying, you know those events? I am no longer going to be in them. I am going to be in a small, thin sound. God now is basically saying outright, I am withdrawing myself from the world. The only way you're going to hear me is through this sound. And it gets worse because in the book of Esther, there is no God in the book. It is total silence. You should just know Martin Luther was trying to put together a canon of scripture. And he looked at the book of Esther and he said, this can't be in the book because it doesn't mention God. Besides other issues he had with other books that seemed to be too, too Jewish. But he wanted to throw out the book of Esther because it did not have God in it. But how can you explain the coincidence 
of, of Mordecai hearing the plot to kill the king? How do you explain the coincidence that the king enters the room when Haman is falling over Esther? How do you explain all these coincidences? It only has to be that God, behind the scenes, is running everything. Does that make sense? If you need to say a hallelujah or an amen, I'm all okay with that. <clears throat> the ultimate... <laughs> The ultimate expression of divine concealment is in the book of Esther. In fact, Esther in English means hiddenness. Okay? So because it's the ultimate expression of God's hiddenness, where the Jewish people were decreed by a human king to be destroyed in one day through the course of human events, God saves his people. I want you to understand the significance of what's happening in the book of Esther. In one day, all Jews are gone. One day. Expounding on the scriptural words confirm and undertook in Esther chapter 9, verse 27, the rabbis saw the Jewish people echo their forefathers' commitment at the Sinaitic revelation mentioned in Exodus 24, 7, of we will do and we will hear. Stirred by the miraculous salvation by God to his people, the nation of Israel renewed their commitment to God's word, accepted his laws with an attitude of law, of, of, I say, of love. Whereas Sinaitic revelation, some rabbis see that the acceptance of God's word was out of fear. The book of Esther's revelation is that the Jews accepted the, the God's word and his commandments out of love. But there was no theophany. There was no sound, but yet the nation was still able to find God. How? Sourcing that the book of Esther was written by the Holy Spirit, there's an opinion in the Talmud that sees that Mordechai, in chapter 4, verse 1, knew all that had been transpiring. You have to understand, if I'm looking at the text, chapter 3 tells me the story that the king and Haman are working together to go ahead and actually destroy the Jews. So obviously, Mordechai knew he would pick up the newspaper the next day. Hey, next year, world event. We're going to kill all the Jews. Be part of it. All right? So of course Mordechai knew. Why is the, the Bible telling me an emphasis that he knew? And in Hebrew, the word knew is yada, and yada in Hebrew is a very intimate word. For there is no word in the Bible to describe intimacy between a husband and his wife. The only word you use is yada. Man knew, for example, Adam knew Eve and had a son. The word yada is a very intimate knowledge of God. And through this we understand that the book of Esther was indeed written from the Holy Spirit. Here's the story. How, what did Mordechai knew? He didn't know after the fact. He knew when it was happening, at the moment that the king and Haman were conspiring, it was revealed to him of the plot. Not only of the plot, but also God revealed the remedy. God doesn't go ahead and give us challenges that we cannot overcome. God never promises us a rose garden but he always promises his, that he will be there. So here is what we call a midrash in, uh, in the whole understanding of Mordechai knowing through divine revelation of the uh, problem facing the Jewish nation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it says over there that not only he knew of the problem. He also knew of the remedy. But there's a story. This is called, in evangelical terms, an affirmation to the revelation. Jews, you'll understand that as you have your uh, interactions with Christians. But there is always an affirmation to the revelation, which means that you hear from somebody else what you have received from God. 
right? You don't do something just because you hear it. You need that affirmation in order to make sure you can do this calling or whatever you need to do in life. Well, for us, in this particular moment, Mordechai receives an affirmation to his revelation that he knows that the Jewish people are going to be destroyed, and he knows what the remedy is going to be. And the story goes like this, that Mordechai goes ahead, and he sees children coming out from the school, and he says, what did you learn today? And the students say to him, you know what we learned? We learned that there's going to be verses, they learned this verse in school that God is actually going to go ahead and destroy the Jewish people, but his covenantal love is there and he will make sure no ultimate destruction will happen. This is the story behind it. And he learns it from the kids that learned these verses, these biblical verses in school. So he received the affirmation. What does he do right away? What does Mordechai do in order to go ahead and remedy the situation in which he received this revelation from God? He goes into mourning, meaning repentance. We've done something wrong to cause the tragedy on us. He goes ahead, according to Midrashic sources, brings out the Torah from the Ark and brings it to the gates of Shushan, the capital, back then of Iran, and reads from Deuteronomy chapter 4. So we have repentance, the word of God that you're supposed to go into and read, be inspired, and then he gets the nation involved in the process, fasting and really looking through yourselves. But he does this through the biggest hiddenness of God. This is very important because what, how did he get the access? The access is within. We do not believe only in God's transcendence. We believe in God's imminence, the imminence within. As we've learned this morning, it is that God is within our soul there is a stirring that happens. There's a communication that comes through. And through that, that's how we operate in the ultimate of God's hiddenness. So here is the secret to understanding the book of Deuteronomy. Remember, I asked the question, it doesn't make sense. Israel says that God is not with us, which is exactly what God predicted and then God goes into more hiding. So you have to pay attention to the verse. When they say that God is not with us, in Hebrew, it's birki bi, within us. God is not within us. So the reaction to God is, of course I'm within you. I will go even more and deeper into your soul. And through that, you will understand who I am. The problem with Israel in the book of Deuteronomy was they were not going to admit to God's imminence. They thought he was a transcendent God. He's left the world. He's left us completely. But in our understanding of God, we know that God is both transcendent and imminent within us. I give this out to you because this sort of gives us the, the basis of having a dialogue on the Holy Spirit. Even Jesus... When he talks about the kingdom, it's in parables. If you're going to talk about something that's huge, you want to sort of directly go ahead and talk about it. Why do you use parables? Well, he is a person that grew up within the Pharisaical traditions of the Talmudic traditions of that day. Kingdom, and remember, the operation is still in hiddenness. We are in second, temp we are in second temple period time. There is a Talmudic saying that there is a difference between the first temple and the second temple where the Ruach HaKodesh is not really there. The, the divine, divine providence of God is not there. The Holy Spirit is not there. I would say what that means is the divine spirit of God has been modified from the first temple to the second temple. And to such an extent, it was very, very hard sort of to recognize God's voice in all of this. God goes deeper into concealment. The ultimate thing, of all of a sudden, our second, our second temple is destroyed. 
If the second temple is destroyed, where are we now? We went from a book of Esther, right? You have to understand, you, book of Esther is crucial because book of Esther takes place between a darkness between the first and second temple, right? You, you could still access God even though you don't have a temple. This is the greatest lesson we can learn from the book of Esther. So when we have a second temple destruction, we could still operate within accessing God within us by doing what? Following what Mordechai did in the book of Esther, repentance, confession, and learning the word of God and coming back to him, what we call teshuva, returning to God. It's not we're finding God, we're returning back to him. Now, many of you are saying yes, because this is exactly what you have learned in your own circles in Christianity. A lot of it is similar in language. Obviously, Pentecost for you in the book of Acts takes on a major more significance. And you should just know the historical narrative in Christianity and the mainline understanding of that until the evangelical movement came in about 150 years ago was that was a once and only lifetime event. Never to be repeated and not to be manifested in any way. There was never an emphasis on the Holy Spirit within the major movements in, in Christianity, historically speaking. You only see what's happening right now within 150 years of what the Great Brother was happening with the charismatic movement, spirit film movement in Christianity. But I say that because what you're seeing right now, because the state of Israel, as we pray in our prayers, is the first flowering of our redemption. We live in the Messianic era. Therefore, God's manifestation is even greater to see than it was prior to the state being born or reborn. Now, some people might be skeptical and still say, well, maybe Jews don't believe in the Holy Spirit. And my answer to you is very much from the Jewish point of view is we pray about it occasionally in our prayers. Now, I'm going to prove it to you. No sooner have they finished celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles that Ezra calls for a day of fasting and repentance on the 24th day of the Hebrew month of Tishrei. This is during the time of the New Year. Day, you know, New Year, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles happens usually in this month. And this is in chapter 9 in, in the book of Nehemiah. And there's no precise reason for a day of penance. It seems to number a, a couple of you know, sins that are personal as na and national, and also what the forefathers have done. But the fact is that Ezra calls for a day of fasting and repentance. And in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 3, it describes the national repentance as a combination of reading the law along with confession and supplication. Sounds familiar? Standing in their places, they read from the scroll of teaching of the Lord, their God, one-fourth of the day, and when the other fourth of the day confessed and prostrated themselves before the Lord, their God. According to the Talmud, the verse becomes the scriptural foundation that gives us the rabbinical fast days that we celebrate in the sacred calendar year. How does the rabbis allow to institute fast? Who gives you the right to institute a fast? There's a fast of a Day of Atonement. That's pretty much biblical. But what gives us a right to institute corporately a day of fast? And we get it from Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 3. Ezra began that foundation, and we use it to go ahead and make fast for corporate Israel. But in the development of understanding these important days of supplication and repentance, we develop prayers to go ahead and express our repentance and, being, and wanting to be close to God. And we call these prayers slichot. And there's a moment in the slichot prayers that we say a certain interesting line. It might be very familiar to you. It says, listen to our voice, Lord our God, spare us and have compassion on us, and in compassion and favor accept our prayer. Turn us back, O Lord, to you, we will return. Renew our days of old. Do not cast away from you, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. This... <laughs> Anyone who knows this line comes from which psalm? Psalm 51. We are invoking this line in this psalm today in our prayers. 
We are begging God not to take the Ruach HaKodesh. Why are you begging if we don't believe? Obviously, we do. Whatever the modification process may be, but we still believe whatever we have is still part of the Ruach HaKodesh. Otherwise, why would it make sense that we would invoke Psalm 51? Obviously, I am coming from the uh, premise that what we pray is what we believe. I'm allowing those who may have a problem, the legal loophole to go around it, but. <laughs> but what's amazing about this Psalm, Psalm 51, it's about King David. King David is an accessory to murder, commits adultery. I'm familiar with the Talmudic sources that we, that we don't put David on, on the same level as us. But at the same time, in the Bible, Nathan is chastising David for what he has done. It's definitely not, in the spirit of anything, godly. And he understands that. David understands that, and he writes in his psalm, please, I do not want the Holy Spirit taken from me because he knows exactly what happens when that Holy Spirit is taken away from him because he himself was the victim of Saul's removal of the Holy Spirit. The severe depression a person goes into when the Holy Spirit is taken away from somebody to the extent that he was almost killed himself. He knows the extent of that, and he's praying to God, please, I know what I did was wrong. I am sorry. He says, this is amazing about David. What is amazing about David is that he did wrong, and the first words out of his mouth when he hears what Nathan says is, Chatati, I have sin. And he realizing that his relationship with God has been compromised and David pleased to be restored, he uses the progression of the verbs in, in Psalm 51 to eradicate the sin, blot out, wash, cleanse, purify. David does not want the same fate and he's begging God to wash it all away. Take my sins, put it through the dry cleaners, so I'm okay and with you, God. Do not want to have the Holy Spirit taken away from me. So from my perspective, the Holy Spirit operates from a concept of hester panim, from divine concealment. We know we can access the God within. The problem with us is that we are not willing to listen to the voice within the soul. That is ultimately the problem. Problem is we wish to be deaf. We wish to continue on our way because when we look at prayer, ultimately, it's about self-centeredness. It's about what my list of do's and don'ts I need. And we don't come with an open heart to go ahead and allow God to reign over us. Holy Spirit is about being led, not leading God somewhere. I'm going to give you a sort of how does this access actually work. As Robert Riskin pointed out, uh, there's a nishmat chayim, a living soul. The soul is from the word nishima, is from breath, but it also has nefesh, which also means a resting place. And the soul is also referred to, does anyone know? Ruach. There are three components to the soul, and the Zohar describes how the Holy Spirit works and communicates with us. It is God's breath. It's like the glass blower analogy to make something of glassware. God's breath is through the tube. It's going into this vessel that's being resting into this vessel, but it always has movement. It's always with breath. It's these three components working together that stirs up the soul. If anybody within the charismatic movement that I constantly hear is something moved you within to get you. It's not all the time. It's not all the time. But when it does, there's a movement. How can I prove to you that there's Holy Spirit corporately in the house of Israel? How do you explain the gathering of the nations? How do you explain a bunch of Jews in the diaspora, living well or not living well, doesn't really matter, 
but making a move and going and returning to the homeland. If that is not a corporate Holy Spirit move, I don't know what is. I've asked people who have made Aliyah, what, is, what draw are you? I can't explain, I, I, gotta go, I gotta go back. It happened to my own life. I moved to Israel almost 10 years ago. And it's a move, you want to be, Rabbi Riskin says you always wanna be a chapter heading in, uh, in God's divine plan, not a footnote, right? And Judaism, the reason why we quote rabbis is that we want to give credit to the revelation that was given to that particular rabbi. It's not about you know, putting doctrines of men above the word of God, uh, but you want to give the source to where the revelation came. But if you would ask Jews why you're here, why are you in this land, it's nothing less than I'm something I'm called to, something I'm moving. Maybe we're not comfortable with the language that I hear God, it's possible. But if you're a person of faith, how can you walk away from that voice? To pray is the automatic need to express yourself to God. How can you be a person of faith and not talk with God? How can you pray and not allow God to talk to you? We don't believe in abstract ideas as people of faith. God was involved in human history. God, the reason why we keep the Sabbath today, and the Sabbath saved the Jewish people is, is an expression in, in our community, is because God is both a creator and a redeemer. We see that in the Ten Commandments. He is involved in human history. What, he all of a sudden stopped after the Second Temple was destroyed? He's not involved in our lives anymore? No, he operates, but he operates differently than you saw previously in biblical episodes. You're not gonna get the earthquake. You're not gonna get the fire and smoke. But you're gonna get something else, which even to me is more precious than anything. You're gonna hear that voice within, which is more lasting than most miracles. Miracles have a couple of days of a news headline, but it's not always gonna go ahead and be the great motivator to continue. There's a proof of that even in Israel's history, modern day history, 1967, there was a big return of the Jewish people back to observing, uh, observance in Judaism. But it didn't last. Because at the end of the day, it's not about the great miracle that God is doing that seems to be out of the ordinary. It's the everyday life that you have with God that will bring you to the place that has the most precious relationship to be with. So this is the type of stuff that we will be exploring in the theological think tank to, as far as the basis of this. But I want to sort of give you a little teaser, tapas bar menu, to go ahead and see the type of subjects we'll be dealing with. Imagine doing that together. Imagine going ahead and finding out what the revelations each other faith is finding within these moments in Tanakh. And then actually going to Israel. I am fascinated how Christians can go through the Bible, but never go to where the Bible came from. How is it that you, you know, if you pay three, $4,000, let's, let's do it. You pay hundreds of $100,000 for a college education to put food on the table, but you can't pay $4,000 to put the Bible into perspective that will last for you for eternity. Now, to me, it's fascinating, because I guess it, Jerusalem has been spiritualized to such a point that there's no need for a physical Jerusalem, but I say to you, the Bible sees that this land is the epic center for everything. This is where you can see every day, just living in Israel, there are Holy Spirit moments. The question is, we're listening to him or not. Imagine going back to the land and capturing those moments and bringing them back to your own community. Imagine rabbis and pastors going ahead and talking about the Holy Spirit and then visiting those places within Tanakh. Imagine going to Mount Carmel. This is where the miracle happened and being inspired to go ahead and bring that invigoration to your own community. I hope I can, this will be not the last time I see you. Blessings. <laughs>